Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Gideon Falls number 21. From Image Comics, written by Jeff Lemire, artwork by Andrea Sorrentino, and coloring by Dave Stewart. You know how much I love Gideon Falls. You probably are tired of hearing me talk about it, but as long as this book continues to be published, it's going to continue to be one of my absolute favorite comic books, and it's consistently going to be hitting the pick of the week or near the pick of the week. This book was masterful. It's innovative, and it's thrilling, and it's creepy. It's atmospheric. It's incredibly effective. This book is amazing. I love the composition. The way that Sorrentino can 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 handle the panels and the flow of the story, the way he uses innovation along with Jeff Lemire, this book is steeped in mystery. It's steeped in in just creepy, just unnerving, unhinged, ultra creepiness. This book is amazing. I love it. Gideon Falls. If you haven't converted to a Gideon Falls follower yet, you definitely should be. This is one of the best books on shelves, and it's one of the leaders of this new horror renaissance that we have in comic book shops. Gideon Falls number 21 is the end of the fourth story arc of Gideon Falls, and it ends just like every other one completely turning everything on its head, making you question what you think this book is, what the purpose of the story is, what the motivations of the characters are. This book is a masterclass in how to make a comic book. Absolutely fantastic stuff. I love it. Gideon Falls number 21 is out this week, and as I always say, it's a great new comic book day when we have a Gideon Falls released. Let's jump over to Marvel real quick because we got X-Men Fantastic Four number one. The first part of a four-issue miniseries written by Chip Zdarsky with artwork by Terry Dotson. Um, I really like this one. I thought it was solid. I'm a huge Fantastic Four fan, so I always like seeing the Fantastic Four kind of get, you know, a little bit of a bump up by crossing over with the X-Men in the midst of all the Dawn of X craziness. Hickman comes in, he takes over X-Men, he's completely changed everything. Everybody's enthralled with it, one way or another, right? But I love this book. I thought it was great. The basic gist of this is, as set up in House of X, uh, number one, I believe, Franklin Richards is a mutant, so the X-Men want all the mutants to be on Krakoa, right? So one day we knew that they're going to have a conflict with the Fantastic Four over Franklin Richards, first son of the first family. Well, this is what this is. This is the X-Men making that move to convince Franklin to leave the Fantastic Four and join Krakoa. And it's such a great it's just a great issue. I absolutely loved it. Dotson's artwork is a little inconsistent and a bit rushed, but Chip Zdarsky completely understands the characters. We already knew he understood the characters of the Fantastic Four. For instance, when the Fantastic Four still didn't have their own title, he wrote the Marvel 2-in-1 series that focused on The Thing and The Human Torch and even Doctor Doom. This has a lot of exciting promises um, that I'm very excited to see what's going to happen. It's got a great ending. I love it. What really sold me on this, though, is the characterization. Chip Zdarsky understands the Fantastic Four. He understands the X-Men and currently where they're at right now. He understands the conflict that would arise between the Richards family and the Xavier family, right? Um, so he really handles that very well, but the conflict of Franklin. Franklin's kind of torn. This is the family he's grown up with. This is a, you know, but he's also a mutant. Right? So he's got a connection to both worlds, and of course Franklin's powers have kind of been on the fritz um, ever since the FF have come back. So you add that in and maybe Krakoa can help him out, so he's kind of really torn in the midst of this, and that drama really sells this series. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was fantastic. One of the best books of the week, and especially if you're not into independent stuff, this is probably going to be your pick of the week. This one's really fun stuff. Really liked it. Highly encourage you to check it out. Speaking of X-Men books, Marauders number 7 is here. This is an okay issue of Marauders. It's not the strongest. After the crazy finale of the arc, of arc one in issue number six, um, I was excited to see where we're going to go from here. And there's some interesting stuff going on in here. Callisto's involved, her new placement in the whole political schemes of Krakoa and the mutants and all that stuff is really interesting. There's some 
badass bishop moments in here. However, the art's a little clunky. It brings in Stefano Caselli, and I was very excited to see it, but it was clunky. I really expect more out of Caselli. There's some moments of just awkwardness in the artwork for me. However, the story was decent. It was all right. It has some great stuff that kind of gets set up, but it doesn't quite fulfill the 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 momentum that was established by the end of issue number six but like i said it's got a great bishop scene it's got some great callisto moments it's got some interesting intriguing stuff in it but especially with the art being kind of clunky it just kind of i don't know it just was an okay issue not one of the greatest i really do like the marauders though and i do think it's a decent entry in what the marauders has been like i said bishop Great Bishop stuff. Ant-Man's got a new book out. This is a five-issue miniseries. It's written by Zeb Wells with artwork by Dylan Burnett. I like Dylan Burnett's artwork. He recently did, well, he did that Cosmic Ghost Rider series with Donnie Cates. Um, he recently just wrapped up that X-Force series with Ed Brisson. So I'm really excited for this one. This was a fun, joyous read. It was very fun. Um, the whole Scott Lang Ant-Man, you know, the way that they approach it now, the Paul Ruddian-isms and all that stuff. He's kind of a lovable loser a little bit. They really handle that very well in this issue. Um, it's got a great flow to it. Like I said, it's very fun. It's humorous. It doesn't take itself too seriously as an Ant-Man. Man book usually probably shouldn't. It's got some really laugh out loud moments in here and I really think Dylan Burnett's artwork is a very strong point of this book. He may not be to everybody's taste but he's definitely to this cat's taste. And man number one is out this week. The Immortal Hulk has a one shot great power. It's exactly what you think from the cover. It's Spider Hulk. The Return of Spider Hulk. So that's always exciting. It's written by Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor does a decent job. You're not going to quite get that gut punch that you get with a lot of Tom Taylor works. There are some moments in here. There's some there are some really good delicate moments, but overall the story is it's okay and just kind of forgettable. The artwork's pretty solid. Molina does the artwork. Trying to figure out who what his first name is. Yeah, Jorge Molina, that's right. Jorge Molina's artwork is very cool and I really did like it. Um, you're gonna have a series of the Mortal Hulk one-shots coming out now. The next one coming out is gonna be written by Jeff Lemire. So I'm very excited about that, but it seems more of a Marvel capitalizing on the popularity of Immortal Hulk um, instead of like a story-driven necessary one-shot. But I don't know, it's all right. It's Spider-Man, it's the return of Spider-Hulk. If you're a Spider-Hulk fan, definitely check that out. Um, it's an interesting concept, and it's really cool to put that focus on a relationship between Banner and Parker, because you don't really get to see that a lot, so it's interesting to see that. But the book itself is it's okay. It's not bad, but it's okay. Star Wars Darth Vader number one, a new Darth Vader series. All these new Star Wars books are coming out. Um, they're all taking place right after Empire Strikes Back, just like Star Wars, uh, uh, on the, the main Star Wars title. Just like that one, this takes place literally moments after Empire Strikes wraps up and it's Vader's what he does next, right? It's written by Greg Pak, who understands these characters and understands the world of Star Wars, so it's cool and I liked it. The artwork's pretty solid. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting artwork. I actually did like it. It's got some texture to it. It's got some grit. It's got some detail. Um, this is basically now that Vader being Luke's father is out in the open, Vader's got some some emotions he's got to deal with. So you kind of got to like a, a Vader kind of going around the galaxy, kind of taking his anger out on things. It's Vader being a badass, and it's pretty cool. Not as strong of a start as the Gillen run or the Soul run, but a pretty decent start to yet another Darth Vader series from Marvel. And I will say this, that out of all the Star Wars stuff that Marvel's done since they recaptured the rights, like in, what, 2015 or whatever, um, the Darth Vader books have been pretty much the best. So this seems like it's going to be right along that line and be a pretty decent Darth Vader book and exploration on that character as a result of what happened to him at the end of Empire Strikes Back. So Vader number one is out this week. Conan Battle for the Serpent Crown number one starts a new mini series written by Saladin Ahmed with Luke Ross on the artwork, Nolan Woodard on the coloring. Really did like the artwork in this one, did not really like the story that much. It's Conan in modern day. Conan in the modern 616 Marvel Universe, I'm not really down for that. I'm not really into Savage Avengers, which does have a zero issue out this week, by the way, if you're interested in that. It's real big. I'm sure it's probably pricey. Um, but this one is okay. It's got Mephisto in it, as you can see there on the cover, and it's it's interesting enough, but not, not enough for me, so I'm not really going to come back on that one. Dark Agnes, number one, starts a new miniseries. Dark Agnes is another character like Conan, created by Robert E. Howard. Marvel's got the rights to all these characters now, like Solomon Kane, for instance. So Dark Agnes here, written by Becky Cloonan. Um, Pizarri doing the artwork. The artwork's okay. It's decent. 
Um, the, the book itself is a little cluttered, a little clunky. It doesn't really ever find itself or its voice or its reason. Um, I don't know. I don't know much about the character of Dark Agnes, so maybe if you have an attachment already to the work of Robert E. Howard and this character, you might appreciate it more than I did. But for me, it was kind of forgettable, and I can't even remember too much about what happened in it. I read this thing like an hour and a half ago. Anyway, Dark Agnes number one is out this week. The final DN one-shot for now comes out from Marvel. It's Captain America, The End. It's written and illustrated by Eric Larson. That's what's really stand out about this. Eric Larson back at Marvel doing a full issue and they're allowing it? What's going on? Anyway, the art's really solid at first. It's that classic Larson stuff that you like, his Kirby-influenced style, but then like a third of the way through the book, it gets really inconsistent. The artwork gets just takes a dive, and you can see where the deadline started catching up to Larson, or at least that's what my, my, my impression of it is. Um, it starts off pretty interesting, and it's got some great Kirby-isms in it, but then it just kind of falls apart for me. Not just the artwork, but the story. I didn't really like the ending or the setup of this. The basic setup is there's some kind of virus going around America, and it's turning everybody into the Red Skull. I don't know. It's all right. It's kind of got a predictable ending. Like I said, the art to me in the first like third of this is so solid and fun that it made me rethink my opinions on Eric Larson. And then you get to the more rushed bits or what seemed to be the more rushed bits. And I'm like, ah, yeah, I don't know. These end one shots were just not the best for me. I don't, I just, I don't know. That one though, if you're a big Larson fan, definitely check that one out. Daredevil number 17 is here. Speaking of Chip Zdarsky, who was writing the X-Men Fantastic Four, um, he's writing this one, Through Hell Part 7. God damn, Part 7? Anyway, this is a great issue. Jorge Fornes on the artwork, Nolan Woodard on the coloring. Really love the artwork. I think Fornes is born to do Daredevil. His work on Batman was ex is exceptional, and his Daredevil work, I think, is probably even better. So Darsky's doing a great run um, on Daredevil. A lot, of these, a lot of these plot threads are starting to come together. A lot of these, uh, these, uh, these, these uh, character conflicts are starting to kind of reach a climax, and it's got a great setup at the end. It's really got me excited for what's coming. Chip zdarsky has been doing such a fantastic job on Daredevil. It does not change this week with issue number 17. It's a solid, fantastic issue. Doctor Doom number 5 is here. Man, I hate this book. I really love the character of Victor Von Doom. One of my favorite fictional characters of all time. But this book is just not doing it for me. Christopher Cantwell is a very talented writer, but I'm just not digging this take on Doom. It's not working for me. There's a moment here towards the end where it feels like, oh, maybe we're turning it back around to the way it's supposed to be. But I'm still just not buying it. I don't like this version of Doctor Doom. I'm not really into the story. There's interesting, the political intrigue and someone's, they're basically trying to do a coup on Latveria. They're ousting Doom and they're trying to take over and this and that. That kind of stuff is interesting, but Doom's responses, Doom's... Doom's motivations, the Kang stuff, it's all just kind of all over the place and out there and it just does not, it just not, doesn't ring true to the character that I've been reading pretty much my whole life, but that's just me. But Doctor Doom number five is out this week. Uh, Salvador LaRocca's artwork still pretty decent, um, but it's starting to feel a little bit like he's a little bit behind the deadline, kind of struggling to keep it out. But Doctor Doom number five is, eh. I'm not really liking this one. Miles Morales, number 15, is here. Um, Salad Ahmed's gotten better at this book. I think at first he was kind of struggling a little bit to find his voice, to find the character's voice and the, and, and the place in the Marvel Universe. Um, in the last few issues, he's really started ironing out his scripts and they're really fast and they really got a nice, you know, quick pace to them. And I really like it. Garen's artwork is exceptional. I really like it. It's dynamic and it's very fluid. Um, the story is okay. This we were still dealing with this whole ultimate Green Goblin being there, and but the ultimate Green Goblin saying and acting in ways that Norman wouldn't, and so you don't really know what's going on. They kind of been dangling this for a while at least it feels like they have been it hasn't actually been that many issues but it's an okay issue it's pretty solid if you've been liking the book i think you'll continue to like it here but there were just some inconsistencies in some of the characterizations on the villains part that kind of threw me off on this one but miles morales spider-man number 15 pretty decent it's out there's a true believers out today and it's tales of suspense issue number i don't even know issue number what let's look it up let's take the time to look it up 45 this is the first appearance of Pepper Potts. So there's going to be a whole bunch of these True Believer one-shots. They're reprints for a dollar of 
key issues in Marvel history. These are all going to be Iron Man related. It's first appearance of Pepper Potts. If you ever want to check it out, there you go. Let's jump over to DC. Justice League number 40 is here. It's the debut of the brand new creative team. Artwork by Doug Monkey. The artwork's pretty solid. If you like Monkey's artwork, you're really going to like this. Robert Vendetti is on the writing. And it's a decent story. It involves the Eradicator, which I always, I mean, I'm always sold on that, especially drawn by Doug Monkey. Um, but uh, the story's okay. It's really going to throw some people off. They don't really go out of their way to let you know, but this story takes place before the ending of Scott Snyder's Just League run. Now, they don't really let you know that, and they're really trying hard to tie it into some continuity. There's a, there's a, to current continuity, there's a, a reference to Alfred's death. There's a reference to Superman revealing his identity to the public. So its place in DC continuity is kind of a little muddy, if that even matters to you. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter to me that much, but the book itself was okay. But after the end of that big, bombastic Snyder cosmic run that I just absolutely loved, it's going to be hard to get me onto a, something like this. But The Eradicator is a pretty good start. So it's an interesting story but it doesn't have the scope that ju that we've grown accustomed to over the last year and a half with Snyder and Tiny and company on the book. Just League number 40 is just okay, in my opinion. Batman number 88 is the third issue of Tiny and Solo Batman title, taking after, uh, picking up after Tom King. Um, this story is uh, kind of revolving around this conspiracy. You got these villains, they come together, they enacted this plan. There's this dude named The Designer. Um, he's got plans for Gotham. There's this weird conspiracy going on. Um, one of my favorite things about what's going on right here is that it's something involving Riddler, Catwoman, um, Penguin and the Joker, and they call themselves, oh man, with the Villains United or, or something like that. That's straight from the 66 Batman movie. This, well, I think the movie was like 67 or 68 or whatever, but remember when they teamed up and they stole the UN and turned them all into pixie dust and all that kind of stuff, pixie sticks or whatever? I love that stupid, silly movie because some days... You just can't get rid of a bomb. Anyway, this issue, kind of weak. A weaker issue is still setting up some intriguing elements, but it's not doing it with enough flair and style that really gets me in. Gillian March's artwork was very impressive in the last issue, but in this one, mm, it's not quite so much, at least to my taste. I thought this issue was okay. If Tinian's run is going to continue to kind of peter down like this, mm, I don't know. We shall see. But Tinian sometimes, especially when he starts a run, does that where the run will start, and it kind of doesn't pick up its momentum until a little bit later on. So I'm very excited to see what's going to develop and unfurl from this stuff. But right now, it's just, it's okay. It's okay. But it's nothing like super bombastic, fantastic. Bat-tastic, I should say. Anyway, Joker Harley Criminal Sanity. Number three is out from DC Black Label. Um, This was an okay issue. It's still good. I still like it. It's a crime oriented take on the Joker and Harley Quinn dynamic. Um, it's not set in continuity like most of these DC Black Labels. Um, Miko Suwon's artwork is pretty good, but now you got Jason Bedauer instead of Mike Mayhew. That really kind of throws things off. It's very inconsistent. The, 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 past, the, the past, excuse me, I've been sick this week, so my voice. Um, the past... Um, this story's got current day setting and a past setting. The past setting in the previous two issues was done by Mike Mayhew, and this one is done by Jason Bador with Annette Kwok on the uh, coloring, and it just doesn't have that realistic quality that we're used to in the first two issues of this. So it's still good, it's still interesting, and I really like this whole, it's like Seven meets the Joker and Harley Quinn, and I like that take, but the art change... The art change is going to really throw some people off, but that's what they had to do to get this book back on time because between issues one and two, there was a long delay, so they definitely wanted to take care of that. Unfortunately, that meant Mike Mayhew had to be moved aside for a more traditional type artist, and it's just not got that realistic pop that the previous two issues had, so it's still good, but it's not as as sleek and sophisticated feeling as the previous two issues, but still a pretty solid issue in a great format. DC's Crimes of Passions is a giant $10 one-shot. Um, they're, you know, these themed one-shots they do around holiday time. This is the the Valentine's Day one, Crimes of Passion. There's a Steve Orlando Batman story in there with artwork by Greg Smallwood, and that's cool. But the big star in here is the Rom V question story. It's the very last story, and I loved it. And 100% am down for Rom V to come on and do a question ongoing. I would love that. I would love that so much. This book was amazing. Um, there, that, that, that story was amazing. Really did like it. In fact, Q 
can we get Ram or Am V and Sumit Kumar on a question miniseries at least? DC, someone, please. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be amazing? DC's Crimes of Passion, $10 for the Rom V little short story. I don't know if that's quite worth the price. It does have some interesting other things, but that's the big standout for me. Um, speaking of big standouts, we got Batman DC Giant 100-page special. Number three is out this week. That's a really cool cover. I like that. So I just wanted to point that out. DC does their own dollar reprints. This one reprints the first appearance of Black Mask for $1, Batman 386. So if you're interested, you know, there's a Birds of Prey movie coming out. Black Mask is in there, so you definitely want to check that out. <clears throat> They got a facsimile edition of Green Lantern number one out this week. The DC facsimile editions are not quite as high quality in the reproduction as the Marvel ones are. I think Marvel really outshines DC with these facsimiles. This is very thin, but it's still cool to have the first issue of Green Lantern there in a facsimile edition with some of the original ads and all that kind of stuff. But I think it would have been better if they would reprint it actually the first appearance of Hal Jordan instead of just issue number one. But Menace of the Giant Puppet... Who doesn't want to read that? Anyway, also from DC Black Label, we've got Daphne Byrne right here from Joe Hill Presents Hill House Comics. Daphne Byrne number one was... It took me two reads to really get into that one. Issue number two, mm, it's all right. The Kelly Jones artwork is still working for me. I really am a big Kelly Jones fan. Um, but the story's starting to get... A, it gets a little unclear. It gets a little... A little... It gets a bit unclear for me in this one. So Daphne Byrne right now is shaping up to, for me to be... My least favorite of the Hill House books, but we're still very early in all of them. But Daphne Byrne is not as solid as the other ones, at least for me. Um, number two was a big step down from issue number one. But like I said, it took two reads for me to really get into Daphne Byrne number one. So maybe if I re read this again, I'd have a different opinion about it. Who knows, right? All right, let's get to some independent titles from Aftershock Comics. We have The Man Who Effed Up Time, number one. This was a real cool treat. I like this a lot. Um, it's John Lehman book, so it doesn't take itself too seriously, but it's exactly what the title tells you. It's about a man who completely messes up time. So time travel's involved. You go into the past, you know, the butterfly effect. If you change one thing, maybe everything's messed up. So dude just decides he's going to go back in a time one week and just, just tweak things just a little bit. And all of a sudden he comes back to the present day and like, Abraham Lincoln was a king, and he's got a dynasty now ruling America, and there's dinosaurs around, and there's like giant pyramids and temples, and what? This book was awesome. It was absurd, and it was crazy. Carl Mostert, um, I really like the artwork. It's a little awkward, a little odd at times. I think it really fits the flow and pace of the story. It may, uh, it may turn some people off, but the story itself was really, really well done. Um, it was, like I said, it was fun. It was ridiculous. It's got some really interesting stuff, some great back matter in there if you want to know the history, um, what happens if Lincoln's not assassinated, and how time gets so messed up from the simple things that happen and change. Oh, I got my ideas about it, but I really was impressed with this one. If you like John Lehman's previous work, for instance, Chew and stuff like that, I think you'll like this one. Um, I really did like it. I thought it was just crazy, fun, absurd, and just hilarious. The Man Who Effed Up Time, number one from Aftershock Comics. From Oni Press, we got a new one called Backtrack. This was really cool. I'm going to go ahead and call this one your sleeper hit of the week. Backtrack, number one. First of all, it's by Brian Joins, um, Jake Elpchek, um, and Doug Garbart. Um, I really like this one. It's about this, uh, so this dude gets a bunch of like wheelmen and stuff like that and puts them together and he's going to have a race. It's going to be a big race. But unbeknownst to them, it's a race through time. So yet another time travel oriented type book, but a really well done book. The, the, the high octane um, action and energy of the, the racing is really captured well with the artwork in this book. The story's captivating. It was easy to get into. The characters were introduced. You follow right along with it. It's got a great hook at the end. Um, very compelling. I really did like it. You may not find many copies of this out there because it's Oni Press and they kind of don't really, aside from Rick and Morty, don't really have a big presence on shelves like they used to. Um, but Backtrack number one is definitely something I would recommend you checking out if that concept seems cool to you. People, a giant car race through time. And it's pretty fun. And I really liked it. So backtrack number one, Sleeper Hit of the Week. I like this one a lot. From Action Lab, Danger Zone, we got Going to the Chapel number four. This is the final issue of this miniseries written by David Popose with artwork by Gavin Guidry. Elizabeth Kramer on the artwork, Ariana Mayer on the lettering. I've been really, really liking this book. It's basically Die Hard at a Wedding. Um, it's a hostage situation at a wedding. Um, so it's like Wedding Crashers meets 
Die Hard. I really do like this book. It's a very satisfying conclusion. I liked it a lot. This is a book with great dialogue, great sense of humor, a great sense of action, a great sense of drama and characterization and conflict, and I really did like it. It was a very satisfying ending. This is something that's just begging to be adapted into film. Begging. Someone, please, someone, please make a movie out of this. It would be great. And you got to get What's his name? Craig Robinson? Gotta get him to play one of the characters in the Elvis gang. Trust me, it would work. This book could really translate into a really fun com action comedy. Um, going to the chapel, though, if you haven't been checking it out, this is the final issue. Trade will be coming soon. I would highly encourage you to check it out. I loved it. Thought it was great. Going to the chapel number four, out this week. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number three. Continuing the excitement from my childhood, two of my favorite childhood properties, meeting up, teaming up, fighting the Shredder, fighting Rita Repulsa, all that stuff. It's got great, kinetic, highly charged artwork, beautiful, vibrant colors, and Ryan Parrott continues to understand the voices of the Power Rangers and how to take a very silly concept and make it something really fun and a great action-packed superhero comic book. He also understands the turtles, so that doesn't hurt it as well. And the way this book ends, I am so ready for issue number four. I am so ready, and I want action figures. I want action figures. Also, Shredder has got the Green Ranger power. What's up with that? Anyway, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number three, out this week. It's exceptional again. The After Realm, quarterly, number one. So this is going to be a quarterly book, which means every few months. Um, it's by Michael Avon Oming. It's huge. It's $5.99, but it's big. It's, think of it kind of like Headlopper. It's that kind of a format. Um, it's a fantasy book. Um, I didn't really like it that much. I'm a big Oming fan. I like his artwork a lot. Um, I was a big proponent of powers back in the day. Um, you can tell Michael Avon Oming really likes Norse mythology in particular. So basically, the 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 idea of this book is that Ragnarok has happened, and the only survivors are the are the elves. So now the elves are kind of slowly going out to the other realms to see what's left and what's going on. Um, it was okay. It was a little long. It was a little drawn out. It didn't really excite me. It had some interesting ideas at first. Um, Fenris was great. Loki's cool in here. Um, but it just ultimately kind of lost me pretty quickly once I got into that initial concept. So if you're a huge hardcore fantasy, Norse fantasy fan in particular, elves and stuff like that, um, and you're a big Oming fan, definitely check it out. But for $5.99, I think there's better buys this week. Um, but the After Realm Quarterly, number one, you know, there you go. It's out this week. Crowded, number 11 is here. This has been such a fantastic book, and this is a fantastic issue. The characterizations, um, the, 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 the personality conflicts, um, all that stuff, this is great. Crowded is a book about, in the not-so-near future, or not-so-distant future, I should say, in the near future, um, people can now crowdfund assassinations. So this one woman has an assassination put on her. We're still trying to slow. We're still slowly finding out why she's got this bodyguard now that's trying to protect her. Um, but she's got the most like hits ever on this on this app. Like it's up to like three million dollars something. So everybody's coming after them. So they're hiding out in this cult, and it's really interesting. Great dialogue, a great sense of, of personal drama, a uh, sense of flow of the story. The artwork is dynamic. It's fun. Christopher Sabella is the writer of this book, and he has been accused of being a verbose um, writer. And I would agree that at times he can be. But one of the things I like about him is that he's able to actually be a verbose writer, but still make that dialogue just flow so naturally and quickly and glides across the page. Crowded is a great book. Not a lot of people are reading it. You really should check this one out. This is the penultimate issue of the second story arc. First Trade is out right now. Crowded is really good, and this is one of the best issues of Crowded. I highly enjoyed this one. Issue number 11, out this week. Isola returns. Issue number 10. Isola's got beautiful artwork. It's got a very confusing story to me. It doesn't help that this book only comes out like every two to three months. Um, so I get so lost in the story. So I'm reading this one. I'm like, it's all right, but what's going on? I'm confused. I'm lost. I love the artwork. This is definitely, I think, something that's way better trade waiting, even though trade waiting is going to take a long time too. But Isola is still a beautiful, 
beautifully rendered book. The artwork is amazing and exceptional. The story is decent. It's not bad. And the characterization is not bad. It just comes out so infrequently. And sometimes so little can happen in each issue that it's really hard to keep up with it. Really. Isola number 10. I might have to stop reading this one issue to issue. And this is actually the end of the, of the second story arc. So I don't know. Maybe I just need to get caught up and get ready for when the third one starts again this summer. That's going to be a while. From Vault Comics, we got Money Shot. Money Shot number four. Um, this one's okay. Um, I think the concept of Money Shot is pretty cool. And at first, they were really taking a delicate approach with it. It's basically about these, these scientists. They can't fund space exploration anymore unless it's pornography. So that's kind of what it is. They decide, well, we'll go out in space and we'll just film porn vid videos with, with aliens, right? And that's how they can fund space exploration. It's an interesting comment on, on the importance of science and space exploration in modern society and, and how you could project that out into something ridiculous. It is a ridiculous book. It does have heart to it. But this one just kind of felt a little clunky to me. I don't know if this is the conclusion of the first arc or if there's one, I think there's one more issue in the first arc. This book's going to continue beyond the, the first arc though. Um, Money Shot's good, but it's not my favorite. And I really love a lot of vault books and I'm not talking smack about Money Shot, but this one is just, it's not my favorite. But Money Shot number four is out this week. A lot of people responding well to this. There are some really laugh out loud moments in here. And what I do like about it though, is it does take the moments to actually have a personal connection with these characters and it's more than just being some kind of irreverent crude um you know porn fest you know and it's a book about pornography but it's not i don't know money shot number four pretty decent but it's all right it's all right so that's what i read this week but i do want to also point out that dc black label has the harleen hardcover out this week and i wasn't a big fan of harleen i know a lot of people were and uh, Stefan Sajik, 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 whatever his name is. Um, a lot of people like his artwork. I think his artwork looks cool. I read the first two issues of this. I never read the third one, so I'll definitely check it out again. But man, they sold me on this hardcover. This hardcover's gorgeous. It's got a beautiful, beautiful, um, it's got a wonderful like texture to it. And it's got this really cool, check this out. You ready for this? Y'all ready for this? Look at that. Did you see that? How cool is that like die cut, like acetate cover there. That's so freaking cool. And like I said, it's got a texture to it. It's a beautiful hardcover. It's very well done. Very, very well done on the binding and everything, man. These DC Black Label's really going all out on their format. It's really cool stuff. Anyway, that's what I read this week. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you excited for? Let me know in the comments down below. We really do appreciate it. Got a top 10 video coming out. Sorry that we've been kind of silent for this whole last week. I was going to do a top 10 of the month. Um, then I got super sick and so I just haven't been able to get to it. Now I think oh, I got to do this week's top 10 video that will be out this week. So be on the lookout for that. Comics Revisited, all that stuff. Check us out at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. We do appreciate it. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at the PCP Army, which is the official Pop Culture Philosophers Facebook group. So if you're on Facebook, join the PCP Army. Join us. Indoctrinate others. Anyway, thanks for rocking with us. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Keep on reading.